Imagine this. You're in Alaska with some friends. You came here to see the Northern Lights, learn the culture, have an experience of a lifetime. You've just walked away from your group for a little quiet time, taking in the peaceful scenery and the river. The water whispers around you and the pebbles crunch under your steps. You hear a baby crying. It's close by. You walk towards the sound. The baby continues to cry. So you walk a little faster and then a little faster. Following the sound, you come to a spot in the river that's peaceful, placid. Scanning around frantically, you look for the child, but you don't see anything. The crying has stopped. Puzzled, you look around again. All you can see in the distance is a cute little otter floating in the water. You start your scan again, going from the other direction. When you make it back to the otter, it's suddenly closer to you. Not expecting this, it startles you. The otter turns its head, making direct eye contact with you. It opens its mouth, and the sound of a baby crying that you had heard comes out of it. Confused, you stare at this otter in disbelief. The cry transforms into a high-pitched whistle, changing from low to high to low. It comes walking towards you with a menacing look on its face. What would you do? My name is Morticia Evermark and my channel is Coffee and Cryptids, where I tell you about encounters and legends of cryptids while I drink coffee. Hi, spooky friends. Welcome. Let's get this party started. In case you're wondering what a cryptid is, it's some sort of unidentified creature, such as the Loch Ness Monster or Sasquatch or the Wendigo that has claimed to exist, but has never been actually proven to exist. If you've been watching my videos for a little while now, you'll notice that I took a little break and haven't posted in a while. I am back to your regularly, regularly scheduled spooky goodness. I'm currently drinking coffee from another local coffee roaster from here in Kentucky. This roaster is Goose Bridal Coffee Roasters. They ended up doing a collaboration with my favorite horror anthology podcast which is called Old Gods of Appalachia. And if you like that kind of thing, I definitely recommend checking it out. It's chef's kiss, amazing. So Goose Bridal Coffee Roasters did this collaboration with Old Gods of Appalachia and came out with two types of roasts that you could purchase that are named in reference to the show itself. They had a like a morning uh, medium roast and then they had a dark roast. I am a dark roast kind of gal, so I went with the dark roast, which is called Old Number 7. And I mean, 10 out of 10, babes, this coffee is so delicious. And I'll make it as like a cold brew like this is, or I'll make it in a French press. Uh, I also have a little mocha pot and make, you know, almost like an espresso version of it. It's just, it's so tasty. Grab a cup and settle in. It's story time. So we all love otters, right? I mean, they're seriously cute, fluffy, adorable, playful, antic-filled little balls of goodness that I don't think anyone could ever really get enough of. But what? if there was the possibility that they could also be shape-shifting monsters that would steal your soul or kill you. What if? That would be horrible, right? Well, buckle your seatbelts because this cryptid that we're about to go into is exactly that. Despite learning the correct pronunciation of Kushtika, I still managed to say it wrong in this video. Just pretend I'm saying Kushtika. There's a legend of the Tlingit peoples of the Pacific North Coast region of North America. That's a, a mouthful to say. <laughs> of a cryptid known as the Kushtaka, 
or a land otter man. So the Tlingit believe that there are some otters that are actually shapeshifters that can turn into men. These creatures have an evil purpose to trap their victims' souls and prevent them from reincarnating. The legend goes like this. As you're walking through your village or hunting in the woods or fishing in the sea, a man or a group of men approach you. These men look just like kinsmen and you really don't have any clue that they're Kushtaka. In some cases, these malevolent creatures appear to you when you're lost or even injured. They claim that they intend to rescue you, but that rescue comes at a cost. They're likely to lead you deeper into the wilderness and either tear you to pieces or turn you into a Kushaka. But it also steals your soul and then you can't reincarnate. Groups of Kushtaka are especially dangerous. They might lure you towards them by making noises such as women and children screaming in distress. But once you see them coming, you'll never escape. Terrifying. The very cuteness of otters is what makes these creatures so dangerous because we're so drawn to their playful nature it's easy to miss the fact that these shapeshifters really just want to consume our souls and condemn us to eternity to wander the frozen tundra i for one don't want to wander any frozen tundras with or without a soul so that's just me it's said that the Kushtaka is able to shape shift into man or otter. Some legends say it can even shape shift into other forms, but it's not really confirmed. There are lots of accounts of Kushtaka who take delight in tricking sailors to their death. Others in which they are friendly and helpful. Uh, preventing people from freezing to death or being lost and perishing. So the way the Kushtaka save people is they distract them with curiously otter-like illusions. The illusions are of this person's family and friends and the distraction is so that the Kushtaka can actually transform you into a Kushtaka, which obviously would allow you to survive in the cold. Obviously not ideal because then you have no soul and you're basically an otter. So, I don't know. Being an otter, having no soul, I don't know. I mean, that's a, that's a really hard, that's a, that's a hard decision. So, just saying. One other interesting fact I found is that the Kushtaka is said to emit a very strange whistle, which is a low, high, low whistle, which I mean, that's, that's oddly specific. So now let's get into a specific story of an encounter I found, which I thought was very interesting. In 1900, there was a prospector. His name was Harry Culp, and he was on a mission to find gold and fortune near Thomas Bay in Alaska. He said that an Indian had given him promise of gold near a half moon lake. So he was on a hunt to find this lake. The way Harry tells it, he got up one morning when he thought he was pretty close to the half moon lake and started out on his trek and he ran across a couple of birds. One of them he shot with the only gun that he brought with him and the other one I don't know, it's unclear. It got away, it fell off the side of a ledge, he dropped his gun, somehow the gun was broken. So when he climbed over the ridge to fetch this bird, he ended up spotting some quartz, which I guess is a very promising sign that there could be gold nearby. So he took a minute to just survey the area and check out if there was more quartz like that in certain patterns which would tell him if there was more gold nearby. 
In doing so, he noticed that the Half Moon Lake was right on the other side of that ridge. So he was like, yes, you know, he was all excited. But his excitement quickly turned to terror. Harry said that he had the scare of his life and that he hoped to God he never saw anything like it again. Swarming up the ridge from where the lake was were a group of the most hideous creatures. Harry said he couldn't call them anything other than devils. They looked like neither man nor monkey, yet looked like both somehow. These creatures were entirely sexless. Their bodies were covered in a long, coarse hair, except where scabs and running sores had replaced it. It's friggin' gross, ew. Each one seemed to be reaching out for Harry with their claws, trying to be the first one to get him. The air was full of their cries and the stench from their bodies left Harry feeling sick to his stomach. Each one seemed to be racing to get to Harry and striving to be the first one to get there. The air was full of their cries and the stench of their open sores left Harry feeling absolutely faint. In his panic, he forgot that his gun was broken and he tried to use it on them. And quickly realizing, oh yeah, my gun is broken, he threw it at them. After that, he just turned and ran for his life and they were so close at that point he could feel their hot breath behind him. They scratched at his back as he ran for his life and he could feel their claws tearing into his flesh. Harry was sick to his stomach at this point from their stinking steaming bodies. Their heavy breathing, screaming and yelling combined with the smell drove Harry insane. Literally, he lost his mind. Harry woke up hours later in the dark in his canoe with absolutely no recollection of how he got there. Other than that, uh, he had the quartz crystal somehow. He hadn't let go of that. And he was super thirsty and super hungry and cold. After that, Harry went and wrote down this entire encounter in a manuscript. The manuscript was later found by his daughter. His daughter had it produced as a story, and it's called The Strangest Story Ever Told. Interesting fact is that that handwritten manuscript by Harry is on display at the Alaska State Library. If you want to read the whole story of his manuscript, I actually have it linked below. Now, people say that there is no real proof that the Kushtaka actually exist. There are some that say that the Kushtaka is nothing more than, you know, a scary story told by mothers to keep their children from wandering too far away of the Tlingit peoples. However, there are fishermen to this day that fear the Kushtaka and believe very strongly in its existence. They will swear up and down that this creature is real and it will steal your immortal soul, leaving you to roam soulless and peaceless for all eternity. I found an old Kushtaka story published in 1908. The story is about a man and a woman who were struggling during a great famine and the name of the story is The Land Otter Son. The short version of the story, the very, very abbreviated version of the story, is that uh, their son had drowned about a year ago. So they were alone and they were struggling very, very hard to find bait, to be able to get fish, to be able to survive. And times were, times were real, real rough for this man and woman. Bait started showing up at their front door. And when the bait would show up, they would also hear whistling in the night around the house. The man and woman are trying to figure out what this is and the woman goes, oh, I know what it is. It's our, it's our drowned son who's come to help us. He's taken pity on us. And so he's helping us out. 
And so the next night when they hear the whistling, they open the door and they invite the son to come inside and say, I know it's you and you've taken pity on us and you're trying to help us. And so he does come inside, but he's not really himself and he hides his face and he can't talk to them. He can only whistle and he'll only accept raw meat and uh you know sometimes he's there and then sometimes he like runs off into the woods and doesn't stay there so time goes by and they're just really racking up all that fish and things are going really well for them and the sun is hanging around them more and he's not running off into the woods and he starts to use human words to communicate with them and they're just overjoyed to have their son back and they decide to go to Sitka and the son helps them pack up their belongings, get everything into the canoe and they start making their way to Sitka. But right before they get there, uh, the son disappears. His arm uh, becomes translucent and the paddle he's holding drops. The woman is like, where is my son? I can't find my son. And they look, they um, lift up the blanket where he had been sitting and he's just totally gone. So obviously they're, they're very sad, but they make it to Sitka and uh, someone asks them, you know, how did you survive with the famine? And the, the man says, it was our son. He, he took pity on us and he helped us and saved us. And so they hold this big feast in his honor. And it's just, it's a very touching story. And I thought, you know, that would be a nice little addition to the folklore of the, the Kushtaka. I've also linked the full version of that story below if you're interested in reading that one. A fun fact that I discovered while doing my research on the Kushtaka is that Charlie Sheen went through a major cryptid phase where he was trying to hunt them down. And in 2013, he went to Alaska on a hunt for a Kushtaka and he never found one, but uh, I thought that was interesting. So, you know, it's true that there may not be really any tangible, certifiable evidence that these creatures actually exist. If you go to Alaska, all along Alaska's coastline, there are just tons of tales and word of mouth that people will tell you about monsters such as the Kushtaka and many others. In fact, that bay that I mentioned earlier, Thomas Bay, it's gotten its own nickname, which is Devil's Country. There are other creatures described there as being at least four feet tall, not humanoid at all with claws. So maybe, maybe that's where all the Kushtaka live. Maybe. There are many sightings of the Kushtaka that begin with a person thinking they're looking at, you know, just a regular river otter playing and being cute. And then the otter stands on its hind legs and acknowledges that person. I think I might die trying to pet this one. Maybe. <laughs> I'm curious to know what you think is real and what you think is a legend. Let me know in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. My name is Morticia Evermorg and this is Coffee and Cryptids. If you enjoyed today's story and you want to hear more stories of encounters and legends of cryptids, please do hit like and the subscribe button and turn on your notifications so you can find out when I post new stories. Sleep tight tonight. Don't let the ghoulies bite. Bye.